Greetings and welcome to the show. Today we look at the Beyond the Boundaries project of the Catholic Archdiocese of Baltimore. Our guests today are the Reverend Jay O'Connor. Good morning. Saint, good morning of St. Andrew by the Bay in Annapolis. And the Reverend Dick Lawrence of St. Vincent de Paul in Baltimore. Hello. Hello. Uh, first, Father O'Connor, could you please tell us a little bit about St. Andrew by the Bay? Sure. St. Andrew by the Bay is a Roman Catholic parish in Anne Arundel County serving the Broad Neck Peninsula area. It's a parish comprised of about uh, 2,000 uh, families or households. Its mean age is about 38 years old. It's a very active parish. We put a lot of energy into religious education and, and worship and outreach. We take a lot of pride in our two sister parish relationships, one with St. Martin of Tours Parish in Baltimore and the other with San Francisco de Assis Parish in El Salvador. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And Father Lawrence, uh, could you please tell us a little bit about St. Vincent de Paul? Sure. St. Vincent's is the oldest Catholic parish church in Baltimore. We're located right downtown, right at the foot of I-83. People of my generation will remember it as the place to take a date after a dance for the 2.30 a.m. mass on the way home. And then you folded the bulletin up and took it in your pocket, pulled it out to show her father when you got home, and he said, where have you been all night with my little, we went to mass, sir. Oh, son, come in. <laughs> right now, we're a parish of about 500 families from Baltimore City, the five surrounding counties, fairly diverse by in terms of race, economics, age, and we have a lot of fun. Great. Um, let's talk about the Beyond the Boundaries project. What is it? I think for us, the Beyond the Boundaries project is uh, an educational effort to have our people look at uh, a faith response uh, to issues of, uh, of poverty, of, uh, of unemployment, of, of violence, and, and of, of struggle, and to make a, a faith response uh, to that, which would lead us to uh, support uh, regional cooperation as we address those issues. Mm -hmm. How did it come about, Father Lawrence? Through the leadership of the hierarchy, mm -hmm. which is sometimes surprising. Most leadership mm -hmm. in the church, as in most other things, comes from below. But here our bishops took the lead and called together a group of priests from the city and from the various suburbs and said, we need to reflect on this, we need to see what the problems are, we need to see what we can do about them. started about three years ago and has evolved now into a program that we're presenting in parishes around the diocese, a small group discussion program to try to learn some of the facts and deal with some of the issues. Mm -hmm. let's, let's talk with, about some of the facts, if you will. Uh, could you tell us a little bit of, of some of the numbers? Where, where are we? Well, we're in a situation where the region as a whole is doing extraordinarily well. Over the last 40 years, the median family income in the Baltimore area, Baltimore metropolitan area, Baltimore City and the five surrounding counties has gone up substantially. The poverty rate has gone down. But in our own generation, since the Second World War, we've created this dichotomy between the city and the counties that never existed before. So the fruits of that are being unequally shared. When my parish was built in 1840, the Irish were on the side aisles. The English, who were the gentry, were in the center aisle. The free citizens of color were in the first balcony, and the slaves were in the second balcony. In those days, it was not only illegal to let white folks and black folks sit together, it was illegal to let the slaves sit with the free black folks. Somebody might tell them all men are created equal, and then where would you be? Right. But we were all in the same building. The, the upper class English and the middle class Irish and the working poor Irish and, and the free blacks and the slaves were all in this because we were all in the same neighborhood. Right. And the city grew. We stayed together. They kept moving the boundaries of the city. North Avenue was called North Avenue because in 1816, when they set the city boundary there, that was the, the city boundary, the whole city was downtown from there. Yeah, it's hard to imagine Baltimore was ever that small, isn't it? You know where the, the basilica is across the uh, street from what all of us natives call the main branch? of the. You know, I was 30 years old before I realized it could not be both the main and a branch at the same time. <laughs> but we've always <laughs> called it the main branch. The church right across the street from that. They took out the land in 1806. It was a donation from Governor Howard. The estate called Belvedere, the manor house, was up on Chase Street where the Belvedere Hotel is now. The southern tip of the estate was down where the basilica is. The board says, we have decided to accept the proffered gift of Governor Howard because we find the site to be a pleasant hill overlooking the city. All of Baltimore was downhill from Cathedral and Mulberry in 1806. 
And as the city grew, they kept moving the line. So that what we would now call the city, what we would now call the suburbs, and the first ring or two of farmland was within the city. It was all one jurisdiction. So everybody lived together. Everybody lived together. We all had our place. The center aisle pews were for the English and the side aisle pews were for the Irish. But we were all in the same place. Geographically. Yeah. And that has changed now. That has changed radically. It certainly has. What changed radically, though, is only a Second World War phenomenon. What we've always had is the out-migration. We've always done that. In Baltimore, it's a pattern. It's a radial city, an old port city. So from the port, the radials go out in different directions, and people move out the various radials. And each, each population group has more or less moved out its own radial. Right. The Polish population has moved east from downtown to Canton to Highland Town to Essex to Middle River. The Irish population has moved north-northeast from downtown to ten, the Tenth Ward that was so famous for a generation or two, to Bel Air Road, to Overly, to Perry Hall, to, uh, to Bel Air. The German population moved north-northeast. It was called Gardenville because these neat, orderly German immigrants built neat, orderly German gardens in such large number. The Wasp population moved due north from downtown to Roland Park to Towson to Worthington Valley. The Jewish population moved northwest from downtown to Reservoir Hill to Pimlico to Pikesville to Owings Mills. The Lithuanian population moved southwest and so on, except, for, of course, for the African-American population, who, because of the impact of segregation, could not. They were confined in an area. Right. In the 60s and 70s, we started to get just the beginnings of fair housing. As well, you know that it's just the beginnings. But what happened? African-American folks, though they were no different than any other folks in Baltimore, they started moving out of radial. And the demographic center of African-American population is now moving northwest out the Liberty Road radial in the direction of Randallstown and Eldersburg. So we grew out all these radials. But as we did, we took the city with us, with us from the line of 97, which was just downtown, to the line of 1816, which was at North Avenue, to the line of 1888, which is where Green Mountain Avenue turns into uh, York Road. Well, I did my assistantship at Blessed Sacrament, which is in that neighborhood. Right down the street from us was Boundary Methodist Church. They called it Boundary because it sat on the city line. Mm -hmm. And then the present city line was not put in until 1918. And the reason they did that was because the city was expanding. After that, they made a constitutional change. We couldn't expand the city anymore. Well, it didn't matter for a couple of generations. I mean, first, we had the Depression and then the Second World War. The city was not growing. Right. After the Second World War, we began to outgrow that boundary. And we, and we grew the interstate highway system. Oh, did we ever. Yeah. We spent all kinds of money in the interstate highway system, in FHA, in VA, and all kinds of things to enable that population to expand. But now we froze the boundary of the city. So white people and, after 1970, African-American middle class people began to move out all these radials across the city line, leaving the city as the, uh, the, the refuge for those who could not afford to move out. Yeah, more know. poor whites than non-poor whites, more African Americans than uh, European Americans, and an immense percentage of the poor African Americans. In fact, we have a little video clip that will show the, the way that breaks down by percentages for the population as a whole, and then for segregation by class, segregation by race, and double segregation. Yeah, I believe that we're going to be running that now. Okay. This chart shows the population of metropolitan Baltimore, the city, and the five surrounding counties by jurisdiction in certain groups. Column one is the total population. The bottom bar there is Baltimore City, and it's just over 30%. 30% of the metropolitan area population lives in Baltimore City. The next bar above that is Baltimore County, and then Andorongo County, and so on for the smaller counties. The second bar shows the poor white population. The chances there of living in Baltimore City go up. 40% of the white poor live in Baltimore City. It's a little bit of an effect. It's not dramatic, but it's real. The third shows the racial effect. 65%, almost two out of every three African-American families in the metropolitan area live in Baltimore City. Now look at the last graph which really shows the combination of the two. 85%, six out of every seven poor African-American families live in Baltimore City. 
That paints a very powerful picture, doesn't it? I think it, it focuses squarely on the problem. How is this project, the Beyond the Boundaries project, designed to address that? For example, Anne Arundel, we saw in Anne Arundel County, has a relatively small percentage of, of poverty and a relatively small percentage of African Americans in, in poverty. Well, I think this program uh, calls us to a more regional or, or community-based uh, or communal, I guess, response uh, to those issues. I really see it as a moral imperative of our faith. Um, our faith calls us not to uh, be alienated, but to build community, not to flee from problems, but to seek to reconcile them and, and, and resolve them, not to competition for resources, but to cooperation with resources to, to uh, better uh, society. And I think what uh, Beyond the Boundaries does is lay the groundwork for people to look at the issues, to uh, take the values of our faith, the teaching of scripture, and to really apply it. I think Beyond the Boundaries is uh, an, an application of faith to everyday life and, and reality. Mm -hmm. uh, Father Lawrence, how specifically does Beyond the Boundaries work? We're doing two things. We have seminars, all-day seminars for parish leaders, community leaders, and then for folks who cannot afford or get their employers to give them a day off to go do something, we have a six-week program, very much like the Renew program that's been very active in the Archdiocese and many other Catholic dioceses around the country, small faith-sharing groups, a little scripture study, a little factual analysis, a little prayer, and a little discussion. There's a six-week program that walks through the facts of this situation, the policies that have led to it, and reflects on them in the light of Scripture. We're trying to get as many parishes as possible to get groups together to, to walk, walk through this program and see if it speaks to their hearts. So in other words, this is something that, that the Archdiocese is going to try to have every parish do? The Cardinal has asked every parish to participate. Now, ultimately, of course, pastors and parish councils will make that decision at the local level but we're really hopeful that every parish will take part. Right. Let's, let's talk a little bit about, about the dilemma th that faces us as we look at these and what to do about these issues. Um, I know that uh, uh, in Anne Arundel, um, you probably see jurisdictionalism. That's one way of looking at it. That certainly <laughs> is true. Uh, jurisdictionalism being let us take care of, of our own area here and uh, the other areas can take care of themselves and, and we'll be responsible there. And that is certainly uh, true. Uh, a lot of times I've talked with uh, other pastors and, and other people uh, in, the, in the county and they don't see a connection. They say, well, that seems to be a problem for Baltimore City. It's okay for <clears throat> parishes in Baltimore City to resolve that issue, but what does that have to do with us? We're down here. We've got our own issues. Um, and that's when I, I, I realized that what Beyond the Boundaries calls us to is really um, a paradigm shift in our understanding of, of these issues and how they can be approached. Uh, Anne Arundel County has been developed as the other counties have been because people were fleeing from problems. Um, my family moved to Anne Arundel County in, in the late 1950s. We were part, I suspect, of a white flight at that time. But what we found is, at least in the area where I grew up in Anne Arundel County, is some of those problems we fled from came right along with us. It took a little while for them to develop, but, but they're you know, right there now. I think Beyond the Boundary says, why don't we take another perspective on this? Why don't we look upon this as our problem together? And how can we work together to, to address the, these uh, problematic issues and be helpful to one another? The, the, the very excellent film that I believe is part of your project, mm -hmm. the Beyond the Boundaries project, um, draws a distinction between jurisdictionalism and regionalism. And you've defined for us jurisdictionalism very, very mm -hmm. well. Um, maybe we should take a look at, at what regionalism is, what, what the positive approach to it, it uh, and I believe we have a clip on this too, that, that gives a definition of what regionalism is. Let's have a look at that. Well, um, let's, let's, uh, regionalism is something that we need to, to look at in a lot of different